everybody. It is six o'clock and we're gonna go ahead and start. Thank you so much for coming to this Middlesex Community Forum on Roads and Rivers. And uh, as people still trickle in a little bit, I will just um, do some quick introductions. I'm Susan Clark, I'm the town moderator uh, and um, the select board uh, asked me to go ahead and moderate our meeting tonight, even though this is not a town meeting per se, it's a public forum, so we'll have a slightly different format. In progress. Um, thanks everyone for coming out, and also um, thanks to the folks who are joining us on Zoom. Do we have any participants on Zoom already? Yep, we've got some, all right, great. So here is um, a, just a brief overview of our packed agenda. Um, we want to make the most of our time together, and we especially want to make uh, the most of the wisdom of our panelists uh, tonight, um, who will be introduced. So here's our plan. We're going to start by having our town leaders introduce themselves. Um, most of them are just going to give you their name and, and their position. Um, Wiz is going to say a little more because she's the convener of the meeting, and Zara is going to say a little more because she is the chair of the Roads Committee, which is doing some amazing work. So. We will then have our panelists take about two minutes each to introduce themselves, a little extra time for them. We were hoping our panelists will tell us, um, you know, your name and position, of course, but your area of expertise so that folks here tonight can really know how you might help answer some of our questions here tonight. Uh, after we do those introductions, we will give you some time to generate your, your questions. And the way we're gonna do that this, um, this evening is a little different. We um, have put some index cards on your seats and there's also extra cards in the back. Um, and what we'll be doing is writing um, on the index cards. Um, and I'm gonna ask you to keep one question per card. So you have lots of questions, lots of cards is, is fine, but don't put lots of questions on one card, okay? One question per card. I'll tell you in a minute how we're gonna do that. And we're gonna collect your index cards and I'm gonna sort them so that we can make the best use of the panel's time. Um, so, um, at 6.40, we're going to have two 10-minute presentations. Uh, one is from uh, the town treasurer's office. Um, this is about the money stuff, right? The flood repair costs, the loans, the reimbursement. Um, and then a second one from uh, our river scientist, Stacy Pomeroy. And she's going to be talking specifically, I think, about Great Brook, which is the brook that runs along Brook Road. Um, and then we'll move right into hearing from our panel. And what I'll do is I'll ask the questions that you have submitted, um, including, by the way, those that, uh, there are a bunch of that, uh, folks who submitted questions online to, to Liz ahead of time because she solicited those on front porch form. So we've got lots of questions already and we'll be taking more tonight that I will be asking. Um, and so we'll have about 50 minutes for that. And we're gonna wrap up. Um, Honey is going to tell us, Honey Bean Baird is gonna tell us a little bit about the resources that um, are here uh, on, on tables um, here, at, here at this meeting so that we can have a sense of what, what we as individuals, um, as citizens, can do. Um, at the end, we're gonna have half an hour. Um, our town leaders, and I hope maybe our experts, are going to stick around. Um, and if you would like to have a follow-up conversation, you can take that time to connect with your neighbors, uh, you can check out the resources, you can have some refreshments, I know there's some cookies and cheese and crackers out there. So that's the agenda. Um, and um, I just want to add, I know this is a difficult time for Vermont. Um, it's Middlesex is no exception. Our conversation tonight is going to touch on some of the very hardest topics that there are to talk about. We're going to be talking about things like money, okay, and our family's safety and our property and our natural resources and the fate of our community. So this is hard stuff. I'm going to ask everybody to try to bring your best selves and ask you a thank you in advance tonight for, for bringing your courage and your patience as we navigate these times together. Liz, do you want to start with the introductions? Uh, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Liz Sharp. I'm the chair of the Middlesex Select Board, and I've been on the board for 11 years now. And this is my first year as chair. Um, and, you know, after this um, July 10th, uh, flood that we had to the year to the date of the previous flood, um, you know, we really felt like it was, um, and seeing the damage that we saw um, that was often repeated damage from previous years, and considering that we had put millions of dollars in repairs and seen some of those repairs um, destroyed, 
um, was really disheartening and it sort of brought us to a moment where we felt like we can't just have these select board meetings and talk about how we're gonna make these repairs and how we're gonna pay for them and that we really need to come together as a community. Um, and I, you know, as, as you know, select boards are mainly volunteer folks um, who don't necessarily come with expertise um, around uh, road science and, and engineering. Um, so we thought it was prudent to invite um, our experts here that are on the panel who will be introducing themselves so that some of these questions that uh, folks uh, like Sarah get and, and we on the board get, um, you know, can be clarified. Um, I do just want to do a couple quick thank yous. Um, so over the last couple of years, um, people like Sarah Merriman and, um, and Eric and Dorinda when she was treasurer um, and Steve Martin spent countless hours um, answering questions, fielding questions, concerns, all of the FEMA paperwork, um, and it's happening all over again. Um, and, um, and I wanna thank you know, Vic and Zara. Um, Zara's really stepped up on the board um, to help out with uh, some road stuff that she'll, she'll tell us about. Um, and Cheryl is now our new treasurer and she's dealing with a lot of all of the payments. So there's a lot that happens behind the scenes. Um, and there's a lot of volunteer hours that go into this, and and you know we 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 know that this is a traumatic time for many people. Some of you have lost access to your homes, um, and some of you you know have been you know are homebound um, after the flood because of the roads. So we do understand that this is um, this is these are challenging times. Um, so I'm really happy to see this turnout, and I, I thank you all for coming and also invite you to our select board meetings where you can learn more, um, because mainly a lot of what we talk about is, is roads. Um, so you're invited there every, uh, the first Tuesday, um, the first and third Tuesdays of every month at, at five o'clock, and you can also watch them on Orca at your own time. So thank you again for coming. Randy? Uh, Randy Drury, Vice Chair. All right, Randy Jury, Vice Chair of the Select Board. Vic? Vic Dwyer. All right, Vic Dwyer, Select Board member. Um, Peter Hood, I know, is joining us on Zoom, is that right? Another yeah, Select Board member? Hi, Thank Peter. You. And Zara, I know, is not only joining us as our Select Board member, but also um, Chair of the Roads Committee. Hi, everybody. I'm Zara Vincent. Um, I've worked in sales and marketing for decades. I'm the chair of the Middlesex Road Committee, which is a subcommittee of the Select Board. Um, the Road Committee had its first meeting on April 18th, 2024, and it's comprised of 17 active members working in four teams. Our goals include, but are not limited to, supporting our town road crew and its efforts to make our roads safe and secure, identifying and asking for funding available to repair and upgrade our road infrastructure, increasing communication, outreach, and information sharing within the community, road mapping the larger ongoing projects needed over the next five plus years that require design, funding, and implementation. Team Fix is led by Marianne Mullen, who is a continuous improvement manager at the Agency of Transportation and is comprised by excavating contractor Richard Cowles, our town road foreman, Eric Mativier. Okay. Prior road foreman uh, Paul Sermonera, prior road commissioners Vic Dwyer and Steve Martin, uh, who is also our current project manager working with FEMA. Team funding is led by Scott Gurley, who works at the Agency of Transportation and is composed by road uh, committee co-chair Steve Dennis, who is also the town's emergency management coordinator. Zach Smith, a private mortgage banker. Ken Davis, a retired business owner, and Eric Matavier, our foreman. Um, the chair of the Middlesex Planning Commission, Jessica Millard, freelance artist at J. Aubrey Designs, and Marianne Mullen, who is womaning a table right over there, where you can find this transcript and some more information about those grants and more plans that the Road Committee would like for you to know about. Um, there's also a sign up for culvert cleanouts and driveway markers um, from the fire department. So there's a, there's a bunch of things to sign up for. Team Future is led by engineer and project manager Dexter Lafave and comprised of Susan Warren, aquatic biologist, 
formerly of the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation and contributing author of the Vermont Better Roads Manual. John Rayhill, architect, and pulling double duty on Team Future is rounded out by Ken Davis, Paul Sermonera, and Steve Martin. There's a lot more information. I have three pages of it. Please, please feel free to take a packet. Let's give a round of applause to all those volunteers. And Zara, people can go to the What's Next Middlesex web page. Is that right? For that is that is correct. Um, Steve and I do need to update it to make sure all of the information is current, including meeting notes. But yes, we have all of our information on What's Next Middlesex. So follow follow this team. Okay. A couple other introductions. Eric. Yep. Eric with DVR Road Foreman. All right. Excellent. And Cheryl. Hi, Sean. <laughs> Cheryl is our treasurer. Um, and uh, it's going to be, we'll be hearing a bit more from her. Um, our experts are going to, um, I hope you don't mind being called that. Um, I know it's a pressure, it's pressure to be called an expert. Um, panelists, how about our panelists? Um, Stacy, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Stacy Pomeroy. I'm a, a river scientist with DEC's Rivers program. I lead our physical science section. Um, I provide technical assistance to partners and communities around flood resiliency planning, uh, project identification for water quality and flood re resiliency efforts, um, and help uh, in general, you know, answer questions around river process and road, road considerations. I lead our river and roads training. Um, so some of your folks from the road crew or other folks, maybe um, they would be interested. We can make sure to get um, those dates out for folks um, where we look at uh, strategies around river and road processes. Um, so I'm here tonight just to help answer questions around Great Brook or other road considerations for them. Beautiful. Thank you, Stacy. Um, Ruben, do you want to? <laughs> uh, Ruben McMartin, I'm the Senior Transportation Planner for the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. Um, I have uh, background uh, in systems analysis, some design. Um, currently, this role seems to be a lot of um, grant management and assisting uh, grant applications uh, in the current role, but um, a very, very broad generalist in the transportation field, so some of everything. I would say. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Todd Eaton. I'm the manager of the Vermont Local Roads Program. Um, I've been in heavy highway construction and maintenance for well over 20 years. Started out with a shovel in my hand out in the Midwest doing pavement recycling. Um, kind of worked as quality assurance with the state of Vermont as a consultant. And now for the last four years I've worked for, I've been the manager of Vermont Local Roads. Um, Vermont Local Roads is a federal program housed within VTRANS. We provide technical assistance, training, and information exchange to municipalities for anything that re that's regarding their net their highway networks. We work with town managers all the way down to the road crews. Great, thank you so much. And um, Mike Klein is uh, lives here in Middlesex, a state of Vermont river scientist, but he is retired, which means he doesn't have to sit up front if he doesn't want to, which apparently he doesn't. So <laughs> do you want to wait? Is that? Wait. Yeah. <laughs> we have a river scientist in our midst. We have two, so um, that would be useful. Did you want to say anything, Mike? Uh, yes, I, I am retired. That's the most important thing you should know about me. But, um, <laughs> I, I did spend my career uh, 32 years uh, working with Stacy and others in the Rivers program, managed it for the last uh, 10 years of my career, and spent better than 30 years doing river restoration around the state uh, related to flood damages uh, and public safety and, and the health of our rivers around the state. Wonderful. We're really lucky to have this much expertise in one place. Um, so um, we want to take full advantage of them. So the way we're going to do it, here's what we're going to do. Um, if you did not come with a specific question, if you just kind of came to listen and learn more, that is totally cool. You are so good. 
But if you do have a specific question, then these next couple of minutes are for you. We have placed index cards and uh, on, on all of the chairs. And there's also pens and pencils in the basket in the back there. Is, Dave, are you there? Uh, yeah, do you want to just sort of, yeah. He, wave your hand if you didn't bring your pencil. And uh, he, Dave will, will give you a pencil. Um, and he also has extra index cards. Um, yes? Uh, change of uh, characters. Change of characters. Uh, Dorinda is going to speak for the treasurer's office. Dorinda is the new Cheryl, uh, and who was the old uh, Dorinda. Um, <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, wonderful. Um, okay, dokie. Okay. Um, so what we will do is we'll take a moment just for you to write silently on your cards. You know, there are some people here who think best when it's quiet, so we'll take one minute of quiet to jot something down. If you could leave tonight with one question answered, um, what would it be? Um, and if you have two questions, please use two cards. Only one question per card, please. Um, as many cards as you want. And folks on Zoom who are joining us on Zoom, you're going to be do using the chat function for this, and we will have someone integrate your questions um, into the mix. Um, so please keep your questions brief if you can and as broadly applicable as you can. Um, you are, feel free to sign your name or be anonymous, it's your choice. So after one minute of silent generation, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ring the bell and we'll take like a few minutes just to stand up and chat with the six or so people surrounding you. So this is one of these informal things, maybe the folks in the row in front of you or, or behind you. Um, just introduce yourselves, take a few minutes to talk with your neighbors. You can read your questions aloud if you want to. Um, sometimes that helps people clarify their thinking. Um, it also might have you, you might end up generating another question, which is totally fine. Um, at the end of those small group conversations, um, uh, we'll collect those index cards. We have a basket for those. Um, and we'll have a runner come and collect them. So briefly, the reason we're doing it this way, number one, not everybody likes to speak in public, so this gives everybody an equal chance to get your question into the hopper. Um, it also gives you a chance to talk with your neighbors. Gather yeah, yeah, with the six people around you. And Mute those people. Yeah. Um, and, um, and then um, also it will allow us to quickly uh, collate the questions. I'm going to clump them to see what is the most pre what are some of the most pressing topics that we have here tonight. So that's going to help us identify tonight's top priority questions and make the best use of our expert panel. So that's what we're going to do now. And so what I'm asking for is 60 seconds of kind of quiet for you to generate some questions. And look what I brought. A bell. Uh, Susan, can I just yes. uh, comment? If you did send your question to me, yes. I have your questions here, so you don't need to repeat them. Right. Yes. I, I actually have them too, Liz. Okay. Um, so, yeah, from the, from the question sheet. Yeah. From the Google Docs. Okay. I cut them up. You cut them up. Excellent. Okay, great. So you can sort them. Fabulous. Yes. For those who submitted questions, um, they uh, we, we do have those questions. So, are there questions from the Zoom folks, Larry, that we need to answer before we start? Nope. Okay, great. Uh, just a moment of silence, please. Thanks. Okay, that was a minute, well done. Um, so we're gonna take about 10 minutes. Please feel free to stand up, chat with your neighbors, share your questions, see if that generates any other thoughts for you. I'll ring the bell again in 10 minutes.
Thank you so much. There are some fantastic questions that have been generated here tonight to add to the already excellent questions that have been generated earlier. Um, so this is really great. Um, the next thing on our agenda is, um, I believe it's Dorinda, um, who is, uh, I think Cheryl was on, the, yeah, so Dorinda, Cheryl, it's, we're, talking, we're talking money. We're talking money for 10 minutes. Um, and uh, so Dorinda, do you have a slide that you wanted to share or anything? Larry, you didn't make the PowerPoint. Uh, there are, it's not on the right computer. It's not on the right okay. computer. Okay. But, but there are handouts in the back. So. Yeah. So there are handouts with the financial figures um, in the back. Um, and if you didn't take one, maybe um, Dave or somebody in the back there could could um, stand up with those and raise your hand if you need a copy of those. Okay. Take it away. Dorinda, keep your hand raised if you want a copy. I'm Dorinda Crowell. I was the former treasurer. When Can everybody hear Dorinda? No. no. Oh, okay. Um, I'm Dorinda Crowell. I was the treasurer in 2023 when the flood happened. Um, and uh, Cheryl was our very competent bookkeeper who now has become the treasurer. And She's the one that put together all these fantastic numbers, but she asked me to speak on them. Um, so for the 2023 flood, we incurred $2.33 million worth of damage to the roads. Um, and out of that, we have only received $529,000 as of this week. So that's still leaving us with a one point 801 uh, owed in loans that we, or expenses that we've incurred. Um, we've been through five, we're on our fifth project manager with FEMA, and we really, ex we've been duplicating all the work uh, many times over, and we really thought we would see more money than we have by now. Um, so, that's that part of it. In order to cover all these expenses, none of the vendors will wait a year to get their money. So we had to take out, uh, originally we spent down all the money we had. Uh, we went out and we took out a line of credit for uh, $1.5 million. And then the bond bank offered up a um, program with a little bit better interest. Uh, so we paid down part of the loan with our community bank. And uh, now we're, we're, we've got two loans outstanding. Um, as you can see, if you have the paperwork, this is costing us, right now we're at $49,000 in interest. Um, so, and with the bond bank, for every $100,000 we receive from FEMA, we have to give the bond bank $50,000. So we're not gaining any money ahead there to continue paying all the expenses or pay any home down. Um, then we got hit with the uh, flood just last month. So far to um, date, we um, incurred another $517,000 in expenses. And we have not been declared a disaster. So that's all on the town. Um, so it's pretty much a pretty dire situation. Um, and we still have another 2,362,000 left in the 2023 flood in repairs. <coughs> Estimated. <laughs> so um, I don't know if anybody has any questions, but. Let me um, ask if the select board has follow up questions um, on during this. I know this is probably not news to you, but are there things that you have heard people want to know about these numbers? I would just add that, um, so our expectation is that we're going to get reimbursed for the 2023 um, expenses uh, through FEMA. And as Dorinda has said, 
it's just taking time and going through different uh, FEMA managers and asking for the same information over and over again and pictures and coordinates and all the things that they've already submitted many times over and having to do it again for a new manager is causing some of that delay, which is why we're needing to borrow um, and also spend whatever money we have in our coffers because we still have to pay our school payment, we still have to pay our regular bills, we still have to pay the salaries of everybody. So there's not just these road costs that we have. Um, and um, the, the good news was that with last year, um, oftentimes in these cases with, um, with these kinds of um, uh, situations where we get federal aid, there's often a match that the state and town have to, um, have to pay, which is like upwards of 25%. Um, but last year's flood, um, I think it came into what, like maybe 3% that we're gonna owe, um, uh, all told. I believe right now, now, I think we might have it all covered. It all covered, okay. I, I think we've, so. we've gotten so far 100% for the program. Okay, yeah. yeah, and we've also heard that um, there's some, there's a certain portion of interest that FEMA may cover right. as well. So, you know, fingers crossed, we're gonna get that money that we spent, which is upwards of $4 million for year one, for 2023, $4 million in repairs. And so what Dorinda is saying now is that we really haven't gotten any of that. We've just gotten a few hundred thousand. Um, so we're still waiting, so which is why we're borrowing. Um, and then we have we had to ask Dirt Tech to set aside their 2023 work to do emergency repairs for the 2024 flood. And we are paying them, but we haven't even gotten a declaration that, that, that there's going to be a public assistance declaration. I think all signs point to there will be a public assistance declaration um, because of the severity of not just our town, but many other towns. But there's no guarantee that we're not going to be on the hook for a larger percentage. We kind of were lucky last year um, in that we really didn't have to pay any portion, but I expect this year we probably will have to pay um, a, a percentage of what could come to a couple million dollars in repairs. I, I, I don't know, I haven't seen every bill yet, but um, so just to give you that that context. Okay, question back here. Budgetary, what is the overlap between these two? In other words, there's a fair work, another two million dollars for the fair work from last year's flood. Yes. There must be an overlap between last year's flood and the work that has not been done and work that needs to be done. My understanding is- Can everybody maybe, hear the question? The yeah, the question is what is the overlap between last year's uh, work and this year's work in terms of the funding? Is that great? Yeah. Go ahead. My understanding, and Eric might be able to weigh in on this more, was it was a lot of different roads or portions of roads that got hit this time around. And it was there was some work like Lower Sunnybrook Road where the same area did wash out again but a lot of it was new damage with the 2024 flood. Eric, do you want to comment? Correct, so, so there is there is some overlap, but not as much as we would hope. It's more of stuff that was already repaired and we were paid for that's destroyed again, or stuff that we hadn't got quite to. Um, it's still yet to be repaired. There was a very small amount of that. And so does that get counted in sort of last year's, oh, we never repaired it in the first place? Uh, no. Okay. No, because it's it's already being forward, going forward in FEMA to get reimbursed for that already, that we've already done and paid for. So it, it'll have to go back again. Does the select board have other comments about the finances, or do we want to move on to our... Rivers and Roots experts. When, yes. Can you tell us? Excuse me, I'm sorry. Just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Stand up and say your name, please. Yes. Dave Clemens, Lower Sunnybrook Road. Can you tell us the change orders and where that work took place? We've got change order numbers, but it doesn't say what was fixed. To change. The dirt the, tech contract. Those change orders were done on the roads that they worked on earlier this year. So it'd be Wood Road, Macy Road, um, the ones they already worked on. So nothing to do with this flood? Correct. Okay. 
Okay. There's um, obviously this is an ongoing situation, and obviously the select board and our treasurers are going to continue to communicate with us about it. But this is a baseline to understand where we're at. So we are going to move on to um, Stacy Pomeroy, who um, has a presentation um, that I believe is going to focus on um, Grape Brook, which is the road that is along uh, Brook Road. Uh, although she may have um, general river uh, comments to make. So Stacy, do you have slides that you want to share? Or? I, I do, and, okay, um, okay. and Evelyn is, um, Evelyn Boardman is my coworker um, and an additional river scientist um, here tonight. Um, she'll be helping cover in the Winooski Basin as she moves forward. Oh, there it is. Um, I don't know if so someone- you can turn off the lights. Yeah. Sarah, are you going to shut the lights down? Yeah. Well, I'm just asking. <laughs> okay. Um, and and I will I'll, I will share these slides um, so folks can have them um, later. Uh, this is just really to orientate some of the discussion tonight. Um, so Great Brook Watershed, um, you can kind of see there are it's about eight eight point eight square mile watershed. Um, it has a number of small tributaries that you can see in the blue mapped lines as, as well as the main stem, Great Brook. Um, it's a little harder to see at, at this distance, but there are also a number of small unmapped streams um, that we can see in the landscape on the LIDAR versus the ortho, which is um, on the left side of the screen, kind of the landscape change there. So that's just kind of uh, setting the watershed there in Great Brook. Um, Evelyn, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, so just kind of um, setting a, 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 a thought process here for context of the Great Brook. This is in the upper portion of the brook. We can see on the LIDAR, um, our three kind of three dimensional view of the landscape that we have a slightly wider valley. Um, there's a little more room for the stream to kind of move around. Um, it has this tiny bit of floodplain access in those areas. I did not travel all the way up through to see the possible damage sites on those, but there was less damage in these areas. Um, you can start to see at the bottom of the screen, there's some um, starting of some gully uh, or, or side tributaries coming into Great Brook. If you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, then we start to move down through along Great Brook and our valley becomes very confined. And this basically means that we're seeing the road, the river, the valley wall. And this is where we really started to see many more of the impacts really pick up. And this is because there's very little room for the river to move in that area. It tends to have um, a steeper slope through that area and it has more power to move materials. So it, it, we go from an area a little further upstream where there's some room for uh, energy dissipation on a floodplain to as you move down through Great Brook, everything is confined or held within the channel during a flood. And that makes it very powerful. We can also see that there are some small tributaries coming in that are also very steep and they too contribute material into the, into the channel during these flooding events. Do you wanna to go to the next one? Okay. Um, this is just kind of giving you a sense of, there's not much room. So we have the road, the river, the valley wall, and um, tight bends where the river does have a little bit of space to kind of make a bend in the valley. And those tend to be areas where material gets clogged up or, you know, because the river's kind of going straight and then it's asked to make a bend. If anybody does plumbing here, you know that water does not like to make 90 degree turns. Um, and material tends to back up. So we have seen those kind of locations where the road gets affected, the river kind of moves around, and we see debris piles in, in some of those locations. Okay, Evelyn. Another factor in Great Brook and other tributaries here in town is that we, um, we're, we have glacial material. Um, the picture on the top is where Glacial Lake Winooski used to be. Um, so we have a lot of 
fine clays, uh, glacial till material that's very susceptible to erosion. And we have um, road infrastructure immediately across from that that we're trying to hold up with rock riprap. And um, the road, and we're, we've squeezed it between the road and the valley. Um, this is causing the the bed of the stream to down cut or head cut into this very erodible material. And what happens is we're, and what we're seeing is in some locations there's a three or four foot kind of um, nick point head cut in the stream that's lowered and it's moving its way up through the system um, as, an, as an erosional point. This means that our valley walls become very susceptible as the bed stream bed lowers. That means the toe of the valley is now exposed more. It also means that in some locations, hard armoring, that big rock that was put uh, up along the road last year or in years past is now kind of sitting on a lens of till material. Um, so as that stream bed lowering process moves through the system, it means that our road embankments are more vulnerable because it's now sitting on uh, very erodible materials. So this is playing a role in, yep, yeah, this is just playing a role in why we're seeing some of the dramatic changes um, in the stream, um, is the, the material itself is very susceptible. Okay, Evelyn. We also have a number of homes in, in a long Great Brook that are on very small parcels between the road, the river, and the valley wall, or the river and the valley wall. And this means that as the river is trying to move and adjust, there's really no area for it to do that. So it's picking up a lot of power in these locations. And as we see those kind of head cut moves move through these locations, these homes and um, the valley walls around them just become very susceptible to the additional erosion and adjustment locations. So it, we're, we're trying to protect homes in the road and we have a very minimal location for the river to move in that area. So we're, we're, we're asking the river to stay in a very small location um, with our homes and our roads. Okay, Evelyn. And then as we move further down Brook Road, um, our valley once again kind of opens up and this is where we have a small amount of floodplain access and the river deposits its material. Our large wood and our sediment um, it tends to be able to have a space to, to spread out in this location. We tend to see more channel plan form or adjustment moving through. So, um, this is often where we see a lot of material end up at, um, or, the, or the river move dramatically through just because it has a little more room in that area. Okay, Evelyn. And then at the very bottom of Great Brook, um, it becomes a, a bedrock confined channel. Um, so pick, picks up a lot of um, energy. Um, there's some homes that are near that uh, the, the stream in that, but the bedrock is kind of holding up the stream bed a little bit. So these areas tend to see widening or movement on the valley walls um, because it can't, can't cut down through the bed. Uh, okay, Evelyn, I think there's just one more. Um, and then um, there are a few stream crossings on Great Brook as you, and some of the tributaries, but um, in the conversation around roads, it's important to recognize we have driveway culverts and we have a lot of cross culverts um, that are also moving water across the roads and under the roads. Um, and when those get plugged or, or, or are small for what the size um, flows that we're having, they contribute in the road damages that we, we see, roads and driveway damages that we see, but they're also contributing a lot of the water moving down into the stream network. Uh, these are really all the slides that I have. I'm, I'm glad to answer questions or go back to them, but really what I wanted to do is just kind of set the stage for folks. So when we're thinking about um, the questions and planning in Great Brook, it's important to recognize that the landscape that we're in is contributing to the challenges that we have. Our infrastructure is also contributing into that. So it's, it's kind of a two-prong or three-prong kind of process that we're going to have to think about our road, our homes, and the channel adjustments as we think about strategies that we want to use moving forward. 
and I'm glad to answer questions or look at anything if folks would like. Thanks, Stacy. And um, Stacy, I know that you visited, actually visited, I mean, yes, these are nice maps, and also you actually were on the ground, and I think maybe with Mike. Um, so um, it sounds like you might have some observations, um, you know, specifically about things that you saw. I'd like to start with the select board um, to see if there are follow-up questions um, that you have for the river scientists that are here. Things you know people have been asking you about, probably. Just bring up two topics that I hear about. Can you grab the microphone? Sorry. Um, uh, conversations around uh, the ability and necessity to uh, remove debris from the waterways, uh, especially after the 23 flood, um, and the contributing factors leading to the 24 flood. Um, so I'd like to touch on that topic and then the other topic that I hear about frequently is historically there have been some areas, especially around bridges, like at the bottom where McCullough Hill is, around removing material, dredging, if you will. Uh, historically, that's taken place, and uh, folks are questioning uh, the stance on basically not hunting waterways and, and giving, uh, giving way to uh, removing some of the materials that are contributing to this. Randy, you nailed it. That is the number one question that has been submitted. What can the town or homeowners legally do with river debris such as downed trees? Um, is there a limit to the amount um, that a riverfront homeowner can remove? Is there a time limit? Um, and at least one person wants to know whether the state is considering changing its policy on that. So um, thank you. OK, so, um, so good questions questions that are being asked similarly in other areas of the state. Um, and, you know, uh, there's, there is removal of material allowed, um, and that is often where we have infrastructure or other considerations where removal of that material can show a benefit to the capacity of the stream um, to convey further waters. One of the considerations that we want to make sure folks recognize is that wood is good in the stream. And while it looks messy and it is contributing to some of the um, impacts that we are seeing, wood also in many instances helps hold up our bed, holds back material and um, contributes to the stability of the stream. So we don't want to wholesale remove all of the material wood material from the stream. What we really saw this year is, and from last year, is um, many times when we've had a flood, wood will be introduced into the stream. There'll be a period of a few years that we won't see another very large event, and that wood will become incorporated into the stream bed or into the floodplain, and it'll become stable. The wood that was generated last year did not have as much of a chance to become incorporated into the stream and the stream bed to become stable. So it was a little more likely to be transported. An area here in Great Brook, and this is part of the challenge, is where the road, the river, the valley wall, we've seen excessive erosion on the valley wall. And this means material, wood material, and uh, keeps being contributed into the, into the stream. And while we may have gone through, um, you know, to remove some wood, if uh, say last year if we'd gone through to remove some wood, we saw enough new contribution that we probably would have seen similar damages. Um, so there's, it's, it is, um, it is finding those locations, and and this is something that the state is looking at with. Um, with the engineer, stream engineer, uh, Jared Borg for Plainfield and for Middlesex is, um, is there an opportunity to have an evaluation of where, where is there locations where strategically removing wood would assist the area? So it's, we wanna work with the community to say these locations, it makes sense for us to help remove wood because it will likely see a benefit to the stream um, for capacity or for reduced, um, debris uh, clogging, but we are, but it's, but there's not funding or nor would we want to remove the entire forest off the valley wall. So 
Some wood removal will help in some areas, but it will not prevent the full damage from the type of flood that we saw. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, So would you like to comment on Phil Scott's uh, order that has people not removing debris? Is that right? No, it's allowing you. To allowing you. Yeah. Okay. Right. A permanent process required, so you can just go ahead and do it. You can forego the permanent yeah. process. So, so we we try to encourage landowners who would like to move, remove debris to work with us in order to make sure that they're removing the material in a safe way. What we want to prevent is folks deciding that they're gonna remove the bar and they would like to dig the channel deeper, right? Because that is in, historically what we have seen both in Plainfield Great Brook and in here is that historic removal of material often dug the channel deep and that triggered those head cuts and it starts to move their way up through the system and that continues to trigger the valley wall failures. So we, we want to make sure that if folks are looking to remove material, that we work with them to say, here's, here's how much material makes sense when you get to this level in the stream and you start to feel the stream bed be hard again, stop digging. Because if you dig further, and in particular in Great Brook, we're into clay, we're into glacial till, and that, that material is very, very susceptible to erosion. So we want to make sure people aren't out just digging the channel deeper because they think that would hold more water on it because it won't. So we want to make sure like we're removing the excess material that deposited in those locations to build back the capacity in the stream, but that we're not excessively digging the channel deeper. Is, is there any truth to that? Excuse to me, when, I'm sorry. I, you should, everyone when they're talking, please stand and identify Sure. Well, no, it's Bennett Shapiro, uh, PR5. Um, is there any truth to it that dredging can actually speed up the brooks and increase the amount of damage that happens during these floods? Hey, is there any, um, yeah, sorry, we'll just repeat the questions, yeah. Um, uh, is there any truth to the idea that if, if you dredge a brook, it actually can speed up the It can erosion. speed up the, when, when water levels are high, the water moves faster water moves and more faster. damage happens. The water moves faster yeah, and more so, so that's a good, that's a great question. Um, and here's, um, I'm a, I'm a, I talk with my hands. <laughs> um, the reason why it can be uh, an issue and it can speed up water is if, if we think about your, your no, that's okay. My time's done, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if we think of your cross section like this, you, you have a wider kind of cross section. If we're digging it deeper, then we change our area and we end up having to, when you change area for discharges, area times velocity. So if we change our area from being wide and shallow to being deep and narrow, we change the area. And the factor that changes in that equation then is velocity. velocity. It speeds up, which means it has more power for more erosion. And this is why we want to be sensitive to when we remove material that we're not going from this condition to this condition because velocity will speed up and will increase the erosion that we would have in the channel, which is what we're trying to prevent. Um, we want the areas of floodplain access, and that is difficult when it's your land flooding or there's lots of material that is that is a very big change, and I, I, I very much respect that that is not an easy thing on somebody's land to see that. But we, we want the energy dissipation on the floodplain. The challenge along Brook Road here is that the channel is like this. So the, it, it has a lot of velocity, and now we have those little nick points that are making it even more deep. And so we're squeezing the same amount of water in a narrower and deeper channel, and that means there's more power in that channel to do work. And the work that it's doing is moving trees and rock. 
until it gets an area down, down at the end where it has a wider slope or a shallower slope and a wider floodplain in it and it dissipates that energy. Um, So Elliot wants to know what are the opportunities for prevention, which is a question that multiple people ask, so um, a great time to take that. Opportunities for prevention rather than just react, react. Okay. So um, there is working with the stream engineer, the community, and some um, additional uh, probably consultants who can help us with really looking through the brook and, just, and helping us identify where does timber or wood management make sense where can we afford it? Because that, your lovely lady's budget here, wood removal is not inexpensive and FEMA does not pay for it, right? So we wanna be strategic in where we do that type of removal, where we're gonna see the, the most likely benefits. Like that big pile down there, if it gets jammed up, it's backing water up, it's gonna affect this portion of the road. We can remove it in these locations, right? So we can do strategic planning for those locations. That bridge is getting plugged up with gravel. We're gonna remove the gravel in order to give it back its capacity so it can pass the flows. So we can work with the community to kind of identify those locations. Governor Phil Scott's verbiage is, is helpful for private landowners. There's no funding typically for, the, for landowners to do that work, um, so it's, it's gonna be on the basis of which a person can afford and choose to do that work. And again, we ask, we, we encourage you to work with us if you're gonna do that removal, just so you're not digging too deep, right? We wanna work with you to make sure that happens. Um, things that the community might consider are, do you give up portions of your road? Do you change the road? Are you able to shift the road? So maybe you have to purchase more right-of-ways or work with the community so that you can move it 10 feet to the opposite side. Give, your, give, your, give a little more room for the river in, that, in those locations. Are there some homes, and, and again, I, I, I say this with respect for the landowners who are here who have homes, um, that you consider a buyout or a change in your use of those homes um, because they become the vulnerable points or they become the reasons that we maintain roads. We need those access points. So it's, you know, that, that's not an easy, those are not easy decisions to make and I respect the landowners having to make those decisions, but those are things that the community may begin to think about as strategies um, because you're right, we, we we cannot manage, we will not be able to manage the landslides that are along the brook in a meaningful way um, for long term. So, one last question for Stacy, then we're going to open it up to more. Um, Pam. Jane Ware, I live on North Sunnybrook Road. You talk about the state maybe compiling a list of these high risk areas to do this, you know, they know these culverts are clogging up. Is there a plan in place in the future? Because we have gone to the state Middlesex garage several times, letting them know the culverts below Lower Sniper Road were clogged. Not once did anybody come and take care of those. Is this going to be new, newly mandated, like bi weekly, monthly? Because they tend to, it fluctuates, but nobody took responsibility. Um, there's no accountability within the state government. Is this like something new that's going to start? Or is this on somebody? you know, existing, is this supposed to be done? And if so, who can we contact to make sure that this is done in the future? Not that it could be living there anymore, but I certainly don't want to see anybody else go through what my husband and I and my daughter have gone through. Thank you. Did, can you repeat the essence of the question? I know you're gonna about to answer it, so. So uh, you're asking, is the state going to assist or mandate cleaning of structures? There's there, there state culverts, like underneath the inter interstate, like off Route 2. That's a state-maintained culvert. State-maintained culverts. That's that. I mean, they're clogged. They're clogged constantly. And we've gone and asked them to come clean 
taking them out. And, they didn't, and that definitely contributed to the clogging, 100%. So state maintained culverts that are clogged. Is there a place that people can be contacting? Here's somebody who's frustrated that they didn't um, get a response. Any thoughts? Please? So I might look to Mike here a moment, but um, so um, VTrans is just like just like your town town road uh, crews with a budget um, and and multiple roads to maintain and take care of. Um, there is not a mandate that I'm aware of, and Mike can speak to that, um, for a certain time period of which folks are out doing maintenance of their larger culverts. Um, they tend to know which structures um, become plugged and and work from there when, when they have funding and resources to do that. Um, we, you know, that's why the state has worked to increase the size that culverts are in, and bridges are to be put in. So historically, up until 2012, the state's rivers program for stream size culverts only had jurisdiction on uh, streams greater than 10 square miles. So even Great Brook wasn't really captured historically. Um, now we have a, a, a um, all perennial streams, regardless of watershed size, um, fall under the jurisdiction of our stream permit and sizing. And uh, we work with VTrans to, you know, continue to put in in good size structures. That that doesn't help us with the smaller size structures that are still impacted. But um, Mike, is there anything you'd like to add? I would Grab a microphone, please. I would I would have punted this question to my transportation uh, partner sitting next to me. Um, you know, really, you know, the, the rivers program is is going to permit the cleaning out of those culverts if it's a perennial stream because it is a public safety property damage issue. Uh, it, it is the responsibility of the owner of that structure to maintain it, and and so um, I don't know uh, what VTrans is. Um, legal responsibilities are, but it, it's worth finding that out. Is there anybody else on the panel that knows the answer to that question? Or other transportation? VTrans does have an asset management program where they do have a basic general schedule of how they work through their the different seasons of different, uh, uh, the different challenges that they're trying to address depending on the season, depending on the time of year. Um, like Stacy said, they have a budget. They also are short of capacity, just like I'm sure Eric has dealt with in Middlesex as far as trying to keep uh, people working. Um, and then they've, they've also had just as much challenge with the um, <clears throat> with the weather events that we've been dealing with. Yeah. So not to make excuses for them, um, but the one the one thing that I would uh, the one thing I would suggest instead of trying to approach the garage foreman as far as you know something that you would like to see done, I would encourage you to reach out to the district general manager or the district project manager, or even above their head to the district transportation administrator. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on uh, to um, a question that came up many times uh, in many different formats, um, questions about culverts. How can the town roads, especially culverts, be configured to minimize damage from heavy rain? And would it be beneficial for the town to control homeowner culverts, upgrade them to sufficient sizes, maintain them so they don't impact each other's neighbor's property? What do other towns do? Talk to us a little about culverts, please. Panel, who would like to start? <laughs> If you may, what, you know, what specifically would you like to begin with? That was that was very broad. It was yes. That's because we had lots of questions about culverts. Um, uh, would it be beneficial, do you think, for the town to control homeowner culverts so that they, um, so that the town has some uh, control over um, making sure that they are to, up to standard um, and don't, uh, you know, of, of sufficient size and maintain them so that people aren't um, one driveway isn't flooding onto someone else's property. Um, so this, I'll speak from my opinion, just because different 
towns have different policies as far as how they handle this. I don't recall how if, if Eric and I have had a conversation as far as how Middlesex addresses this. So I'm not, again, this is my opinion. Um, <clears throat> my opinion would be that the town should, should maintain control over the maintenance of all culverts within their own right of way. So that would include driveway culverts. Um, however, like I, I was here early enough to hear the select board talking about a new driveway entrance that was being voted on, whether there was going to be a culvert installed or not. Um, my suggestion would be that the property owner, or you know, however, however, the you know the developer, whoever is putting in that drive entrance, would be on the, I guess, hook to pay for the addition of uh, you know the, the the driveway culvert, but then the. Um, what I think would be the best approach would be for the municipality to then maintain maintenance of that. Just because it's their road that gets washed out, the driveway culvert doesn't doesn't get cleaned or is not maintained. And then um, what is the town supposed to do if a property owner refuses to maintain their driveway culvert or for maybe for a number of different reasons is just unable to financially. Does the select board have follow-up questions on this whole culvert question? Um, yeah, could you please um, sort of explain sort of the science behind the why, especially last year in last year's storm, for example, um, and this may also be tied into the, the riprap, the work that, the stonework that gets put in ditches, um, why so many driveways washed out? Like what, what failed? Um, with the, the culverts? Was it their size? Was it the speed of the water? Um, generally speaking, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, these are weather events that are much larger than any of these, any of these you know, structures are designed for. So are they too small to handle the water? Yes. Um, you know, it's, is it too much water? Yes. It, the, it, I believe Stacy referred to the Q ratings being increased, especially since Irene. You know, but the, at the same time, if we're talking about a Q50, we're, we're what what is a Q rating? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, that that's, that refers to a discharge or or an event. Um, folks are most uh, often have heard FEMA's hundred year event. So that basically is statistically, it says it's a 1% chance in any given year that it could um, occur. And so we've obviously seen that that can occur more than once in a year as well. And so as Todd had mentioned, our sizing of structures and particularly our drainage networks structures are not sized for a 100 year or a 1% you know, chance event happening um, so um, we often uh, will see too that historically um, on our streams, the stream culverts, not just the driveway culverts, we were sizing for how much water we would, we would expect to go through. And so um, we didn't account for the sediment in the wood moving through. And so our structures, those round pipe culverts that are perched a few feet off the ground, they're they're undersized for how much material in the side stream that's moving through. In our drainage networks, um, we too had picked a size like 18 inch, and 18 inch in one location on the hill may work, but if you have other small tributaries or drainage coming into it, that 18 inch at the bottom of the at the bottom of the drainage network hill may not be sufficient. So we also have to think more broadly about the size ranges that we may need for our structures and that one size does not fit all within our drainage network. Um, Bennett Shapiro. Sorry, Bennett. I'm, I'm sorry. Ben Talk to me. Oh, just, <laughs> is there some damage we're doing to the discussion when we call these 1% events when they're clearly not 1% events, when they're happening three or four times in a 10 year period? They're not one in a hundred year events at all. And I mean, is there some reason we're still using that nomenclature when it's clearly wrong? 
Bennett wants to know uh, why we are still calling them 100-year events, and is, are we damaging our perception of reality yeah. by calling them that when they happen twice a year now? Any thoughts? It's a little bit philosophical. It is. <laughs> yes. Um, it, it, unfortunately, we, right now, that tends to be the language we have currently that most people are familiar with and that our statistics from these events have not been fully um, reevaluated. So the, the rain event in St. Johnsbury was considered a thousand year event, right? Based on, <laughs> based on the amount of rain that came in the short period of time. So when we look at the statistics of that, it was a, you know, it would have been considered a thousand year event. Um, the, we work with USGS and our own, um, and FEMA will start to reevaluate these events and recalculate what the size <coughs> discharge flow is that would be associated with that event going forward. So we would still probably use the same language, but our perception of what and how frequently that size event may happen would change. So, you know, it might be two inches, historically had been a 100 year event, going forward two inches may be a 50 year event, right? So our, our, the language probably won't change much, but our perception of what's um, associated with that size event will change. Thank you. And we're gonna get back to our, to our questions on the cards. And by the way, it sounds like if it's a 2,000 year event, then that's biblical, is that how that is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Let, lots, lots of language here. Um, there are, um, I think that ties into this question that several people have. They, people just wanna know what are the guidelines when the road crew goes out to repair a road post flood, you know, do they have access to and rely on guidance from particular experts, whether it's civil engineers, whether it's river scientists, on what to do to maximize uh, uh, the prevention in the future. Lots of questions about what we are doing to prevent uh, you know, the, the next um, uh, damage when we are repairing this damage. Uh, anyone here want to just give the public an idea of what uh, you're using as guidelines? There, there's several, I guess, documentation as far as guidance that's provided to municipalities. Um, and the select boards have the option to either adopt or reject, and, and basically the town road and bridge standards come in seven different sections as far as the different pieces of a highway network that they address. The town has the choice to adopt some of them and reject some others, or you know adopt all of them. There's some incentive as far as uh, additional funding that comes from the state for certain ones that are adopted. In addition to that, um, there's there's uh, mandated standards under the municipal road general permit or what we call the MRGP um, for what we call a hydrologically connected segment um, basically a, a segment of road that's close to a waterway those are regu strongly regulated and dictated as far as the stand minimum standards for what needs to be installed that's where you're seeing a lot of the stone line ditches that some of you may have been upset about in the, in the past um, but what have also shown over time as what we used to call these best management practices, and now the municipal roads general permit just made them a regulation. A regulation. And a lot of these practices, um, roads that see more runoff, have shown over time that it does help the roads remain more resilient. But again, in such events as we've, we've been experiencing, unfortunately more frequently, can't guarantee you can't you know you can't guarantee that the road's going to hold up to that amount of flow. Do other panelists want to make a comment at all on that? Yes, and there are stream engineers um, that do help the community. So the stream engineer came up through um, to work with the road crew and the consultant um, who's dirt tech to make sure that um, they're able to put put the repairs back that meet the standards. Um, to make sure that um, they would be eligible for FEMA funding, uh, to identify where there are like, this is gonna be a temporary repair because we don't have enough rock or the size rock or the things we have. So those areas also get flagged um, so that they can work with coming back uh, to the community um, and, and doing a full repair if needed. But all of that is, is um, done with technical assistance. And then the RBC,
Um, yeah, the RPC does. <laughs> Can you tell us what the RPC stands for? Uh, Regional Planning Commission. So um, there's, uh, uh, I believe you had Lincoln here earlier spoke. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so we do work around um, the MRGP, local hazard mitigation planning um, assistance with. Uh, seeking grant funding for planning or um, construction uh, or repairs or improvements for roads um, as well as being able to provide um, technical assistance and decision making um, I think that there was a mention earlier about uh, the frequency of these events um, particularly around the Great Brook and Brook Road um, the possibility of what we call it in my business strategic retreat, which is um, thinking about your alternative access for parcels and um, abandoning pieces of infrastructure that, that can't be sustained in the long run. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and in addition to that, um, also we have uh, for four grant recipients, should there be limited time capacity, we also do some project management. We can act as a municipal project manager um, instead of a town if they have limited capacity for doing some of this work. So Eric, did you want to any, say anything about the guidelines? No, I just, we do follow the, uh, the state standards for all the roads and we've We've been in contact with them for for proper sizing, doing hydraulic studies when needed. Um, so, yeah, we we follow it pretty strict. Thank you. Okay. Um, there is a follow-up question. We were talking about the culverts and the ditches, the riprap, um, uh, which are those those big rocks in the in the. I mean, I don't that I just found out that that's what that is. Those big rocks that are on the side of the road, um, which somebody here seems to be calling stack and pray. Um, these are somebody who doesn't um, maybe think that they're being effective, are they holding up? Um, it, uh, can you talk with us a little bit about the long-term solution for erosion and how that ties in with, with riprap? And Liz, I think, might have a follow-up question about the riprap as well. So riprap on the river bank um, versus rock in the ditch, which I'll let Todd speak to in the drainage network. Um, the rock on the river bank um, is not a permanent solution. Um, it is a hard armor that provides us a um, higher level of erosion protection than uh, in strength than um, simply vegetation trying to put back or, or small material. Um, the challenge in Great Brook is because it is till material is sitting on, um, it, it has the potential of being undermined. Um, the other challenge we see with hard armor riprap is that um, it needs to tie back into stable locations. And so we'll see a, a small area of rock um, and then it'll get outflanked because it, it erodes on the upstream side. The other challenge with rock is that it will speed up velocity along the, the bank and it will often transfer that to downstream areas. So it's a give and take. We're trying to protect the road. Rock is our, our, our most viable option in most instances um, for that type of infrastructure protection, but it comes with its own challenges um, and it is not a forever solution. I'll let Todd speak to that and the drainage network. It's as far as the stone of the ditch lines, it's a similar theory behind armoring the ditch to, to reduce it cutting down erosion. It, it reduces the velocity of the water. It helps uh, treat the water in some sense as far as um, filter out any of the smaller sediment that might be trans, trans, transferred down into a water resource. So it has several different uh, you know, uh, the word that I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> Functions. Functions. There you go. Thank you, Benefits. 
Are there alternatives to riprap that people use that? Um, get, 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 the one of the ways that I like to present it, in, in, and I think Stacy would agree as far as even the riprap in the rivers, is that it's the most economical solution or short-term solution. Um, and that's, I mean, obviously economy plays a huge, huge concern into a lot of the different things. Uh, why do we not try to design a road to withstand a, what we call a 100-year flood? Because we can't afford it. But we can't afford this either. We can't afford this either. So. This is why we're having hard conversations now. And as Ruben said, sometimes the hard decisions in those is, do we try to find a strategic way around that so that we can abandon this particular um, you know, roadway segment, but find another way to access property that's not gonna be so, so susceptible to flood damage. Just one solution might not be in a certain situation that might not be possible, but then we have to think about other potential ideas as far as how do we work around this so because we can't there, there's a nice gentleman in the very back against the blue wall who's been putting his hand up a few times and then down because other people up front have caught sorry and then i'll follow back up with you can you tell us your name sorry yeah or can you come up here mark nobody can hear nobody you can hear you gotta come up I've been on the Brook Road for over seven years, and uh, I think a reasonable expense for what we've been given. Uh, it's God saying that we had this flood. Now we know where the worst areas are where that stream wants to go. Just about anywhere along that brook is easily accessed by the road. Uh, in front of your red raft, if you had some Pile sheeting going into the leading edge and the trailing edge of the band usually. You keep your rip rack, you can drive it in that clay probably uh, forever. Uh, so it would keep the rip rack expense. Uh, it would direct the water where it wants to go. Uh, another thing, I think. Culprits are side aggregates. The problem is the volume of water that's coming through there. Those culprits can't dump into flood situation. So of course they're going to happen. Um, above the center road where the brook road comes in, excuse me, the bulldog valley. They don't farm it anymore. Uh, there's this one house that may be impacted, but if there was a, a dam, I know that's a bad word, but it's going to hold the volume of that water so the culprits can work, it would alleviate a lot of the volume on that particular ground. Uh, nature likes to put it on slope. Anything's on ramps, off ramps, on the interstate, they're all two to one. That's where nature has to be. There's no two to one in the morning after that. Okay. Center down through. So, trees are maturing through there. So, the shallow soil is not able to hold it. So, any, any tree 12 inches in the morning should be cut off. Thanks, Mark. I'm, I'm going to um, cut you off mostly because I know that there are lots of people who can't hear what you're saying. I hope that the panel could and maybe could um, repeat some of the question uh, so if you want to respond to any of those suggestions. Thanks so much. Mark. Responses to those thoughts? Um, yeah, thank, thank you for your, your thoughts there. Um, most of our dams in Vermont were not built as flood control dams. Um, sim simply installing a, a, a dam in the river will will not provide flood control. Um, it you know create a nice pond, but it doesn't create storage necessarily. So yeah. if if we if we, we have a microcosm of a right here in Canada, right here. If if we. So, 
So, so there's a there's a difference in a flood control dam versus a, a dam, um, just a standard dam. Which a, typically a standard dam, you know, you're, you're putting you're putting something in the stream and, and it creates a pond behind it, right? Uh, a flood can a flood. I'm sorry, Mark. We can't have back and forth here. It, we, we, yeah. it, it doesn't work for the whole group. There is going to be a half an hour at the end of this meeting where you can have individual conversations. But if there's a uh, if there are elements of this um, yeah. conversation that are relevant to the whole um, town, we would love to hear your, your comments. Okay. So so it, we would need to investigate more on a size and style and location if we wanted a dam to function as a flood control dam, right? It's not just putting something in the river and expecting that it will pr provide us flood control. So that's that's something that we would need to investigate more is a, is a potential style of, of a dam, right? Um, where And where it would be that would provide the most benefit because we have lots of tributaries coming in. So putting it in one location may not provide a benefit to the entire area. So if, there, if, if that was something that the community really felt was important, that would take a, a bigger investigation, right? Um, it, it is costly to remove all of the trees across the entire valley wall to prevent them from, from being contributed to the river. And I don't know about all of you, but would you like to see the entire forest stripped off? So it, 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 we do want to look at strategic wood locations for management and, and how those could be done to help provide the best benefits. So where it could be trimmed, where it could be removed, that can help provide those benefits. That's something certainly we want to work with the community on. So I, I, those are good questions and, and, and response, but they would take more study in order to really provide the potential benefits that were suggested. Thank you. So there's a question that multiple people have asked um, that is basically a question about the schedule for maintenance in regards to culverts and ditches um, to avoid issues in the future. Um, is there going to be, or can you explain to us what it is, the schedule for maintenance um, and uh, who determines the priority of the, of the road repairs? Um, uh, so th these are fundamentally questions about how the town works, so just a little more um, transparency so that people can see how you do your work. We don't necessarily have a scheduled uh, culvert cleaning setup. Um, that is one of our goals, I believe, uh, as the road committee is setting up areas through town that we can get, get on a cycle to go through and make sure all the culverts are clean. Um, that had, was never set up in the past, and quite frankly, we never had this kind of issue before this year and last year. Um, so we are working towards doing that. So do you want to talk a little about the road committee? Sure. Um, just to let everybody know, and you might already know, but obviously when an event like this happens, the first priority is to make our roads passable to emergency vehicles um, because we don't know what's going on with any individual on any, on any single road. Once the roads are passable to emergency vehicles, then we uh, move towards looking at you know, people getting out of their house um, so that they can go grocery shopping or go to whatever appointments that they have. Then we're rebuilding the roads uh, to two ways so that they're even safer and, and going back and, and cleaning that sort of thing up. Um, I do want to say that uh, the road committee has been working really hard. There is a, there's a little uh, handout um, in the back that Marianne has. Um, and one of the things, that, not only this, but also in terms of finding ways to pay for this that does not affect your taxes. So we have filled out you know, $4 million worth of grants uh, funding, Eric's already won us 12, but we're, we're obviously really concerned that financially uh, of how we're going to pay for all of these things. So that's where it's stray, but that's, that's kind of the deal. That's where we're at. Are there any, do the uh, panelists want to talk at all about, um, in terms of schedule of maintenance and the, the way other towns do it, are there comments that you want to make on that? or? I can, I mean, I can speak to the guidance that I try to encourage municipalities to adopt, but most of it is general as far as, you know, there's, there, there's, I'll speak to it as a trainer, um, reaching out to different municipalities and trying to, you know, have them maybe 
potentially think in a different way than they had in the past, but you tend to speak in general terms because there's just too many unknowable factors that can that have to be assessed on a local basis. And so, um, you know, generally speaking, as far as culvert maintenance, you wouldn't typically have something that you would call a, you know, a maintenance schedule as far as you're going to touch this culvert every so on or you know based on this many months or this many years what we how we address that is a asset management plan where we have uh, an ongoing process of cul culvert assessment so somebody goes puts their eyes on it you know this is the condition it's in this is if it's you know quarter full if it's plugged or if it's got any sediment that's settling in and basically we're you know, keeping an eye on them in that way, I do uh, suggest, and I'm fairly, if, uh, well, I'll let Eric speak to it, I don't want to speak for him, I'm sorry. But um, I do suggest to just, in just every one of my drainage classes that a town tries to put on, you know, as much as possible um, to adopt some type of five year maintenance schedule for cult for ditches um, to go around and to address any ditches that might, that might need some, um, some work, rather they're still lined or not. Um, the, to, it, the way that I present that is that ditches are the cheapest, the cheapest thing that a that a town can implement and maintain <coughs> to protect your roadway infrastructure. The ditches get full, then then that's tends to be where your mud holes open up in this in the spring. If the ditches get full, then that's going to be where your erosion is going to hit if you have a high water high water event. No, go ahead. Uh, this, all I was going to say was that um, CVRPC does uh, conduct a culvert inventory program. So, and I believe that is actually on a five-year cycle. Is that is that every five years we will right we get some guys for the summer and we'll see some young lads, mostly lads, showing up in your town, looking around all your culverts and ditches and bridges, and you know assessing. Uh, blockage levels, structure condition. Um, so there is that effort ongoing, but that is separate to, right, that's just a, that's just an assessment. That's not the actual uh, maintenance or clearance piece that I think is being asked about here. Yeah, yeah sorry, it looked like Eric was gonna say something to did you? I, I was just gonna say that was just done, I think we got the report last year, okay. last summer, early last summer. Okay. Sarah, did you want to make it, grab the microphone? Just to, to build off Ruben. Um, Can you grab the microphone? Sorry. I'm not saying anything that's stunning, but for nerds um, who are into culverts, thank you. Uh, there is a, you go to vtculverts.org. <laughs> I know, I know what y'all are doing tonight, right? You can zero in by Regional Planning Commission and you can actually see every single culvert, every single culvert in Middlesex. You can click it on, you can see the size, you can see its shape, you can see the results of the assessment report. It is really cool. You'll, all your culvert questions will be answered. The only ones it does not show is driveway culverts. You know, Eric, not to say it. The main complaint that we got after town meeting last year was that Sarah didn't have a microphone. Everybody always <laughs> wanted to hear what she was saying. See, she was just in his Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's that's helpful. And um, in relation to that, there was a follow-up question about class four roads. Are they going to be looked at for washouts um, near streams or rivers? So how do the how does class four roads tie into this um, planning? They will be looked at. Um... We're just trying to get the main roads opened up right now. Does does FEMA um, pay for class four road repair? Do they evaluate them? That is a great question. I asked her. I you don't know. Okay. If I had Wi-Fi, the answer would be that. Mm -hmm. I don't. Okay. You don't know. But they weren't included in, in last year's flood. No. Yeah. So that may be your answer. I don't. I think there's okay. free school Wi-Fi. Sure. Well, probably. It's open. It's open. 
two funding questions. They may have completely separate answers, but I will put them together. Um, one of them is grants for prevention. Are there any grant or funding programs available to help homeowners, homeowners with flood prevention, not just recovery, but to plan ahead? Um, so grants for prevention is one question, and another question is um, state buyouts uh, for riverfront property owners who are at risk of being flooded. If they were interested um, in relocating, what um, uh, uh, is available um, for, um, for, for that possibility, given exactly uh, what Stacy said about respecting homeowners' rights and that this is a personal decision, um, are there uh, buyout monies available? I, I do believe um, that FEMA may have some mitigation funds that homeowners can look to to do some level of mitigation um, and flood resiliency on their homes. I, I would have to, I could follow up on the email. If you put that in the question, we can ask our floodplain managers to provide more detail on what that would be. Um, currently, FEMA, if you're in a mapped floodplain, FEMA mapped floodplain, um, they do have a, a buyout uh, program. Um, many of our locations that have been damaged were not in mapped floodplains. The state, um, after Tropical Storm Irene, um, put together the Flood Resiliency Community Fund. That funding has been available for us to work with homeowners who are in those um, locations where FEMA, where they may not qualify for a FEMA buyout, um, to qualify for a state buyout. Um, my understanding is the state we, we went through that money last year, but my understanding is that the state put around 11 million or so back into that fund um, and that they'll be looking to do grant applications or um, this, um, Al, do, do you know if that was available when you, for allocations yet or? You could apply. You could apply, yeah. Yeah, right, so, um, so folks can, um, go to Vermont Emergency Management uh, website, um, and there's information about the potential um, of state-assisted buyout. And and again, if that's a follow-up question, we can we can provide the links and, and information in a via email to you guys. Um, that is definitely going to be one of the questions at the end, and I'll just ask it now. Is um, up, there are um, many more questions that than we are going to be able to get to tonight. We will be compiling all of them, and some of them we are hoping we can direct to you if uh, as needed. Is that are you going to be available for those kinds of questions, all three of our panelists? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, would, um, I would say best case scenario, put it in a <clears throat> put it in a Google Doc or something similar that right, so that it's just can go in and just yeah. I have I have a response to that. I have a response to that. Um, I just wanted to say, in terms of the grants for um, homeowner preventive measures, I am uncertain as to whether um, they have funding specific, specifically for that, um, but I have made a note to myself to um, dig through the Vermont League of Cities and Towns uh, grant listings because I know that they do have some um, home or property owner specific grant opportunities and whether any of them cover those, I'm uncertain, but um, I have made a note for myself to go back and, and dig through that reference and I will get somebody in your town an answer to that as best I can. Could you also, one of you just explain, we are applying again for the emergency watershed protection and how that fits into um, protecting homeowners with mitigation. So the emergency watershed protection funding comes from NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service. And that's um, under the US um, Agency of Ag, um, NRCS. And that funding um, becomes available to help a community who is willing to sponsor it for some landowners given the risk to their home or infrastructure 
um, emergency funding to help repair that. Um, it, it may be eligible where FEMA is not eligible. It can help with things like uh, bank stabilization. Um, sometimes it's used to help with removal of um, debris or other um, work that isn't often covered in FEMA or needs to be done in, in a quicker time frame than FEMA. Not every home is going to qualify for that funding. It depends on your level of risk. Um, and it does take a community support um, for that funding to be brought into the community. Yeah, go ahead. Adrian, did you have a Middlesex is part of this program. We did it for the flood in 2023. We had about 30 people that applied, 10 properties qualified, and they right now are getting design, engineer design and um, permits and hopefully the construction of the um, whatever their design qualified for will take place this fall. We are hoping if we get a federal um, disaster declaration from the federal government that we can re-up that program for the 2024 flood. And I will put that in front court form if that's true and people can apply. The state engineer comes out and man looks at your property and decides whether you qualify. And as you said, it's pretty particular, it's pretty specific. But for the people who do qualify, this year they're covering 100% of the cost and the engineering cost, so there's no cost to the homeowner. Um, the program specifies 75% cost that the federal government pays and 25% that the homeowner pays. We were lucky last year that it went to 100%. There's no guarantee if we get that this year that it'll be 100%, but even 75%. It's 75% of the construction and 100% of the engineering cost. So as soon as that declaration comes, we're ready to go with the 2024 flood. And I will put that out in front of the forum, so just keep your eyes out. If you think you might qualify, if you have any thought that you might qualify, go ahead and let me know, and then the engineer will come and let you know. Could you clarify that, do you know, I don't think there has to be a, um, declaration in order for the EWP. I thought- and That's what Mike, that's what Mike says. That's what we're waiting for. Okay. So that last the, meeting, we put everything in place. Okay. As soon as that declaration comes in, we're ready to go. Okay. Adrian, you should tell people who you are. Oh, <laughs> I'm Adrian Nikita. I'm the chair of the Conservation Commission. And the, because Sarah was overwhelmed with FEMA a year ago, the Conservation Commission agreed to take this on. Thank goodness Central Vermont Regional Planning District or Commission came along and they're helping me to manage this because they know what they're talking about. And I just do what they tell me to do. <laughs> and I correspond with the landowners. But it's been a great match and it would not have happened without that. I I don't know if I'm exactly so. But we need the amazing people like you, so thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, okay, well, uh, there is a wrap-up question um, about the long-term outlook, um, and this is, I think, what everybody is wondering about. Again, it's a little bit of a philosophical question, um, but what is the overall long-term five-year or 10-year or 20-year outlook? We're talking about rainfall, roads, repair, expenses, tax increases. Um, would either the select board or our experts um, care to hold forth on, on um, what we should be thinking about. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh, one of the one of the four teams on um, the road committee is Team Future, and they are looking at all of that an asset management plan, like the city already has. Um, they're asking all of those big questions, and we could obviously use your help with the answers. Um, our next meeting is going to be. Thursday the 15th, if you want to join us via Zoom. Um, but that's our volunteers are kind of asking those questions uh, for you and finding the answers. And as soon as we do, we will certainly let you know. I, uh, I offered Zara some positive feedback before the meeting started, just after you know reading this document and seeing all the great work that these teams have done. Um, if, if you know, if me that works with all the different towns throughout the state, if I could copy and paste the, that team in every town, it would be amazing. Aww. And it would be a huge thing. And 
it's so as uh, I think the best answer to that question is do as much as you can to support that team that's supporting your road crew to do the good work that they're already doing in Middlesex. Thank you. Susan Warren, I know, is on that committee. Do you want to say something? Grab a microphone. I just want to take the opportunity to um, thank Eric and the road crew for the incredible amount of work they put in to getting our roads back up and passable, and it's ongoing, and they're still in the middle of all this other contract work and I just know that you guys have been working incredibly hard and I just really appreciate that. questions then we can answer in one meeting and especially some of these are very very specific to a particular road or a particular place and they're better answered um, in a Q&A uh, type, a type of, of thing. Every single one of the questions that came in tonight um, is being compiled and it is going to go to the select board and to the roads committee so even if we didn't answer them tonight this was a really useful process in helping the town leaders identify your specific concerns, and this will uh, enable them to address them over time. Um, and so from this list, when there are questions, and we have answers um, of general interest, Zara has offered to post those questions on Front Porch Forum, um, So, and it will also be on the, on the What's Next Middlesex website. So those are the, um, the kind of ongoing um, thing that, that will be happening. Um, and I also, before we finally wrap up, I do want to tell you that there's a little blue piece of paper, um, and we, it's by the, by the door there. Um, please give feedback on um, what was useful about this meeting and what wasn't. What suggestions you have for future communications. This problem didn't get solved tonight, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> And um, so there's going to be ongoing communication and ongoing work. So how can we, um, as the how can the select board, the roads committee, uh, the solutions committee, um, uh, improve uh, communication? Please feel free to to offer those. And um, I will just add one last comment from someone who said they didn't have a question, just appreciation for the town's crew and for Dirt Tech. Any co final comments from the? I, I will just say thank you all for showing up and having interest in your community and supporting your community's efforts. The, there is no easy answers, and you are in for not a sprint but a marathon. A long, it, it'll be a, it, it will be a long process, um, and so um, just continue to be mindful of ideas um, and that things may change. Um, from the way that they are um, currently and that that is not always easy so I'm really appreciative of everybody being here and being open to these discussions um, so thank you very much for having us thank you. and thank you to the panelists um, for coming and sharing their expertise so let's give them a round of applause to say in sort of response to the the long-term um, outlook like you know 20 years from now what's what's everything going to look like I, I don't know what Brook Road is going to look like I don't know what um, any of our roads are going to look like um, but what I want to a thought that I've been I, that, that, that I've been thinking about for a while now um, especially in light of all of the responsibilities that are put on these small towns is that Vermont is unique in that it has, each town has its own governing body and each town is responsible for itself. Every small town here has their own emergency management plan. Every small town has their own select board, their own road crew. We're taking road crew from other towns to because we can pay them a little more or vice versa. And it's, you know, we've come to a point where, you know, we, we can't rely on volunteers to do everything. And that's sort of what's happening right now. 
um, and it's not sustainable. Um, and you know, I think in a in a better vision is that there's more county government that that works with us and works with these small towns to help small towns partner together with things like funding and grant writing um, instead of this this competition that ends up happening. Um, and poorer towns don't have the same resources that maybe more wealthier towns have. And so I see hope for some change on a state level that really looks at our towns differently and thinks more on a region level than making the onus on our small towns to bear the burden of what's happening right now with all of these increased costs. So, you know, unfortunately, I don't see our taxes going down. Um, but I do think that we need to start being creative and talking to our legislators because we can't make those changes. Those are all things that happen in the legislature. And telling the legislature that this isn't working for us, right? Because this is, we're, we're not going to be able to continue to sustain storms like this. Eventually, the money's going to run out. And then what? And so I just, I don't want to leave it on that like unhappy note, but like I, I want to, you know, I want us to think creatively, right? And think about ways that, that we can um, change this model where, you know, we're, we're trying to survive with our little town of, you know, how many people do we have? I don't even know, 1,700, right? Even FEMA said they, they've never seen anything like this. They go to these towns and they're like, why aren't you doing this on a bigger level? Like, why do we have to go and, you know, talk with, with the road crew of this little tiny town about their magnitude of their problems? So I encourage you to, you know, think about it and contact your legislators. Are, are there any legislators here tonight? Ann Cummings was here. She, she was, was okay. Oh, she's still there? She just left. Oh, okay, yes. This is also one of the things that um, uh, we can not necessarily, re that we can regionalize through regional planning commissions, a lot of, a lot of that. So is there a comment that you want to make on that? I can speak to that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, uh, CBRPC um, has, and I believe it's ongoing, um, is trying to get our member towns to sign on to what amounts to a mutual aid agreement, um, a standardized mutual aid agreement. And um, there has been internal discussion about figuring out how to parlay that into something that looks like a, a uh, collective procurement vehicle as well, right? So that instead of Middlesex having to buy not the actual gravel that they want at twice the price from whoever will grind it for them, you get Middlesex and Worcester and Waterbury and Duxbury and whoever else all together, and they can go make a bulk purchase and they can get their inch and a quarter granted or whatever it is that Eric wants, and you can get it cheaper and you can buy uh, your replacement culverts in you know at, at scale, right? And that is that is a huge. Um, it's a huge obstacle is the, the reality that a lot of these towns just, you can't do it at scale. And so you're going to pay retail and it's going to, it's going to impede your ability to do all the things that need done because that budgetary constraint, when you can't get that economy of scale in your purchases is going to hurt you. Um, and uh, you know that I think the reg the regionalization conversation. I know that um, that is something that's happening on some levels. I think inside the league of cities and towns, trying to try. I know some people are thinking about what a model of that would look like. Um, I think that one thing that you will run into um, uh, the potential obstacle there is going to be the cultural one of. Um, the the local control um, and right the idea that that um, somebody outside is going to tell us how to do anything and I think that um, you know that, that there is probably a conversation that needs to be had about <clears throat> local capacity and what the actual local capacity is and what that means for how much local control there can 
actually be because at a certain point if you don't have capacity control is an illusion um, so I think that you know and, and um, so there are conversations happening these are things being thought about um, I can't speak to anything going on in the legislature um, I think that I think that setting up something that looks like a county government system like you might have uh, in other states is would be pretty tough sledding because there really isn't a county government at this point i mean i think you're talking about like state constitutional amendments to set up a new level of government um don't quote me on that i'm not a lawyer but <laughs> but i think that's i think that's the the, the level of, of effort that you're talking about for something always going to be that tension between those two good things meaning the, the ability to be to control things locally and also the ability to share it's always going to be that balance that we sounds like an ongoing conversation um, we need to end um, and honey is going to give us a few words about the resources that are um, here for you tonight things what can you do oh, sure. Um, my expertise includes snacks, so on your way out on the left there are some snacks, please enjoy them. Um, also on your way out, I know you've been here a while, thank you so much, but please um, connect with the crew team that are here. They are a FEMA long-term recovery group and they support Middlesex as well as Waterbury, Duxbury, Bolton, and Moortown. They have some mold kits, they have some water testing kits, they have information about how you can be a volunteer with them so please visit them they also have candy um, also the middlesex community fund is up there we really appreciate them they offer grants for education basic needs disaster relief scholarships they're always accepting financial donations and they're looking to expand their board so please connect with amy and mary beth and lastly on your right as you go out there are some signups if you would like to be um, if you'd like to be involved in middlesex emergency management so if you were a person who's like, yeah, I would help open a shelter if a shelter is needed, or I want to be part of setting up a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor communication or be able to check on neighbors you know, in disaster times, please um, write your name down and we'll connect with you. Thank you. There's, uh, I think there's also a table um, that has information about the Roads Committee so that you can find out more about um, what it is doing. Sarah, final word to you. How would you guys like to have local control over the chairs? I know you would. <laughs> Here is a candy. Like a local control over the chairs. <laughs> <laughs>